A few years ago I was shown a 3D reconstruction of the Overlook Hotel that had been designed as a level for a computer game called Duke Nukem. I was told by an email correspondent that the designer in constructing the 3D replica had stumbled across spatial impossibilities in the Overlook sets that had made a continuous 3D level impossible. The result is that the Overlook Hotel featured in the game mismatches the one in the film in order to be continuously playable. One of the apparent design errors that was made obvious by the Duke Nukem level design is the window in Ullman's office. The surrounding hallways wrap around the office and so the window is spatially impossible. This anomaly is so utterly blatant that it could not have gone unnoticed in the set design and construction. The lights shining into Ullman's office would have to be positioned inside the walls of the surrounding hallway. When the place was built in uh, 1907, there was very little interest in winter sports, and this site was chosen for its seclusion and scenic beauty. Well, it's certainly got plenty of that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when I later acquired a copy of the US version of The Shining and watched the additional 23 minutes of footage that are not in the European release, I quickly noticed another set design flaw. It is the scene in which Ullman shows the Torrance couple through the Colorado Lounge. The camera scrolls from one end of the lounge to the other, giving a full view of the giant windows on the far wall. But look at the background under the stairway. Two people emerge from a hallway that wraps around the back of the wall. How can this be? We've just seen five gigantic floor-to-ceiling windows on the very same wall, supposedly giving us a view of the hotel exterior. In a visit I made to the Kubrick archives in London last year, the staff managed to locate the blueprint designs for the Colorado Lounge, and it confirmed my suspicion. A hallway was shown leading around the wall and disappearing into emptiness behind the lounge windows. The hallway is impossible. Having found two examples of windows that shouldn't exist, I decided to go through the film scene by scene and draw maps of the Overlook sets. It turns out that the hotel is full of impossible and illusionary designs used by Kubrick to disorientate the viewer and to communicate the illusionary nature of the Overlook Hotel. Inside the Torrance's apartment we find windows in the living room, bedroom and bathroom. Due to the bathroom window being at a right angle to the other windows, the apartment should be placed on a corner of the building structure. But when we eventually get to see an exterior view of the bathroom window, we find that the other windows could not possibly exist. The exterior wall extends in both directions. And that isn't the only spatial impossibility of the Torrance apartment. A section of hallway runs along the outside of the apartment and ends at a T-junction. There's an exit sign posted up on the right wall, implying that a door and fire escape is just around the corner. But any fire escape in that position would likely overlap the Torrance's bedroom or bathroom. But an even more blatant error is that there's also a doorway to a room which spatially can't exist because it would be hovering outside the hotel exterior. There's also a second doorway to the Torrance apartment, which is spatially impossible because the Torrance apartment is several feet higher than the hallway. The hotel. None of the other bedrooms are heated during the winter. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Ullman. Goodbye, girls. And here are your quarters. Living room, bedroom, bathroom. We do see the reverse of this door in the apartment bedroom, but there is no stairway leading downwards toward the hall.
Another odd piece of design is the two doors are placed unrealistically close together on a corner near the Torrance apartment. Each of these doors would lead to the exact same room. The hallways near room 237 also feature a variety of spatial defects. The doorway to room 237 is neighboured along the same wall by two other apartment entrances. Each of them is just a few metres away. This doesn't leave much room for spacious apartments, but when we do eventually see room 237's interior, we find that the entrance leads left into a large living room, which then leads into a large bedroom, and then a large bathroom. The apartment totally overlaps the position where the next apartment should be. The other neighbouring doorway near room 237 should also lead to an apartment, but we can see at the end of the wall that there's another set of doors leading to a stairway. This stairway exists in a position that would overlap any potential apartment. So the doors on both sides of room 237 don't lead anywhere. They are illusionary. And it gets even more crazy. The long wall facing room 237 runs parallel to the Colorado Lounge. And from the end of the hall, we see right screen that this whole wall should be roughly 2 metres thick. Yet it features 5 doorways to apartments. Apartments that spatially can't exist. In the same tricycle scene, Danny first passes room 237 on his right, then rides around a squared section of walls before turning back down the same long hallway, so that room 237 is now on his left. If we look at the section of walls that he rides around, we find that it is also just a couple of meters thick. On the side facing the Colorado Lounge, there's a door to an elevator, but on the opposite side it features two more doorways. Once again, how could any apartments or even an elevator fit in this small space? So most of the doors in the room 237 hallways lead to rooms that can't exist. As Halloran shows Wendy and Danny around the kitchen, he disorientates us by walking a spaghetti-like path. He then tells Wendy, Right here is our walk-in freezer. And then opens a big steel door. The shot cuts to the freezer room interior, but look at how the door swings in each shot. In the shot outside the freezer room, he grabbed the handle of the door with his left hand, but when the shot cuts to inside, he pulls the door open with his right hand, and the door swings open from the wrong side. When they step back out of the freezer room, they emerge from a door that is opposite the one that they supposedly entered. We can tell this by the large windows of the chef's office. It's also difficult to notice this error because the camera position is flipped sides from when they entered, giving the impression that they're on the same side of the hall. Halloran now walks around a corner and takes Wendy into the storeroom. As they walk from the freezer room, they pass another door on the same wall which is just two or three meters from the corner they're about to turn. This is yet another of the film's impossible doorway motifs, because any room behind this door would overlap the storeroom, which in size is at least five meters squared. Obviously Kubrick wasn't just interested in making pretty pictures with the set arrangements. When I came up here for my interview, it was as though I'd been here before. I mean, we all have moments of deja vu, but this was ridiculous. It was almost as though I knew what was going to be around every corner. <laughs> and the spatial mind games don't stop there. We see the entrance to the hedge maze in three different scenes. The first two times we see it, the entrance is facing the camera and the hotel can also be seen left screen.
but when it comes time for Jack to chase Danny, we find that the entrance has shifted to a different side of the maze and is now facing the hotel. In the second shot of the maze, we're shown a map directly outside the entrance, and there's a hedge right behind the map. Shouldn't this hedge be inside the maze? This map and its accompanying hedge are missing in the other shots of the maze entrance, despite the wider and more distant camera positions. <laughs> 